I made another mistake when I first came. It was about the second baby that I, I saw when I, I first came to Guatemala. And this baby was the sick kind of a baby that we are taught about in medical school and in residency, but we never have seen because it doesn't really exist. And this child was about two or three months old had um, terrible um, malnutrition and was dehydrated. Um, weak cry, um, irritable, poor muscle tone. And I said to the mother, I said, look, you need to take this baby to the hospital. They can rehydrate the baby and feed the baby and this baby will probably be okay, but you really need to do it. Because if you don't do it, what's gonna happen is this baby will die. Mother says okay, father says okay. They go and they talk to the, the father's parents and the, the mother-in-law is the one who has the most control over the children, even more than the mother of the child itself. The mother-in-law says, well, if the doctor says the baby's gonna die, then we'll just keep the baby here. We won't go to the hospital. And indeed, two days later, the baby did die. And what they were worried about is, and they sort of took my words and twisted them around, but what they also were worried about is if they take the patient of the, the baby to the hospital to a place they don't trust, really, that's bad. And that if the baby does die in the hospital, then it costs them 6,000 Q to get the baby out. This is of a family that makes 30 Q per day. So this is lots and lots of money for them to do it. But the government, the way it's structured is, is that they have to go through this mortuary process and so it costs them more money. And so what they decided to do was to not spend the money. Now, I never say that again to the, to the patients. I never use that kind of a, a tone or, or use that kind of a, a language to them because I don't want my words to be misconstrued. And so what I have to do is respect that what they do, this is not what I agree with them. I don't want them to do this, but I don't really have too much choice in it. And for me to, to have confidence in other venues, I've got to be able to put up with things that are pretty hard for me to swallow. The fact that they, they don't understand, the fact that they don't have access to medical care, the Ministry of Health here is a, a big, big problem. What the Ministry of Health here is mainly set up is to do preventative care. They are not set up to do curative care, except in the national hospitals. And so if someone comes to the Puesto de Salud, the health post, basically what happens is they often don't have medications. Or the, and even the doctors that they have can't do anything other than say, you have this, give them a diagnosis, give them a prescription, but they don't have the money to go out and buy it. And so all these things sort of add up into the fact that a person can't get good health care here. If you're Ladino and if you live in one of the cities, 
and Ladino is a, is a mix of, of Mayan and, and Spanish. And they consider themselves to be better than the, the Mayan. They're the ones who discriminate. If you're a Ladino, um, oftentimes you have services, you've had a better job, and you have more of a family that has more resources. Those people have, have care. In the Mayan population that we see, most of the time is neglect. Most of the time when a person is dying, um, the family doesn't ask for too much um, for them, don't ask for too much in the way of pain control. Um, and we don't see them until oftentimes it's the last, last part of their life. We had a woman in San Pablo who they called us to see her because they said she was diabetic. And some nurse had gone up and done a finger stick glucose and it was like five or 600. So she was diabetic. So we go up to see her. This woman looked like a skeleton. And this woman had AIDS and um, had not been treated for AIDS and everybody was neglecting her. She was in a little cubicle in her own little room and nobody was giving her much for food and she was too weak to get any food. And she was so weak that she couldn't get up, that she was urinating on herself and defecating on herself. And when we went to examine her, we spread her legs open to look at her perineum and she had maggots in her vagina. I had never imagined this ever, had never seen anything like this, but the family had known about it because they had been changing some blankets, but they didn't do anything about it. And so mainly neglect, mainly you die, you die by yourself, and if you have pain, you, you do what you can, your family does, does it, but we haven't been involved as much as we'd like to be involved. The only difference is pretty much the, the being Maya and being poor go hand in hand with one another. And it's not necessarily their, their ethnic background that causes this, other than the fact that they have darker skin than most people, and that they have this lack of education, and that there's been discrimination against them for a long time. You ask yourself, why weren't there schools around? The reason was, is because if you educate these people, then they'll want to go off and get better jobs, and then they'll cost more money to employ them. One wonders if keeping them down um, socioeconomically makes it so other businesses can hire them at a cheaper price, and therefore um, they never can advance. And so they're in this vicious cycle of what we call the, the vicious cycle of poverty, in which they're poor, 
And so the kids are malnourished, therefore they have bad uh, cognitive function, and therefore they have poor economic opportunity, which keeps them, again, so the next generation is also in poverty, and this cycle goes on and on, generation to generation. And this has gone on since before the Spanish even came. This was a, a characteristic of the Maya. Um, I understand with the, um, uh, when the Maya were, were here and before they were conquered by the Spanish. They had a similar kind of a, a stratification of the classes. And so it's been a problem for, for ages and it just continues. It's hard for us to believe in this, uh, the 21st century that it still exists and with all the resources we have, but indeed it does. The more we've been here, the more we've been consistent, the more we've been able to build up trust, the more patients we see. We began seeing somewhere around 20, 25 patients a week. Right now, we're seeing about 400 patients a week. And we go to different locations. Instead of just being in Santa Cruz, which is where we started, we now go to five different other locations and see patients in, in all sorts of venues um, with all sorts of socioeconomic status all poor, but some poorer than, than the others. And some of the things that we do is to use, uh, to use medications that have a small number of doses. We use azithromycin, which has three doses that we have to give maximum. Or for children, we can give it in one dose. We have the other option of using uh, medications like uh, moxicillin, which require 30 doses, or some cephalosporins require 40 doses for complete treatment. But our patients can't do it. They will never learn how to do it. They will never complete those courses. And so it's a waste of time for us to do that. But again, these are things that you have to learn by doing, is we've had to learn what the patients will accept, what their expectations are, what they perceive their needs to be, and we have to tailor our medical care to that. Um, we can't get them to accept medicine the way we practice it in the United States. What we do is give a lot of injections here, and we give injections because people expect them, and that's what people consider to be good medicine. Now, I was a little worried when I first started giving injections, there's so many injections, that I might cause infections. And this is a, certainly a risk. And one of the things we were always taught in medical school is give few injections because you might cause an infection. We don't have infections from giving injections. And I give lots and lots of injections here. I probably give 20 a day, whereas um, in six months, I may give 20, maybe not even that many in six months in the United States. And I talk to them in a certain way that they understand, examine them only by asking their permission. I don't push at all. I show them the greatest respect that I can, and I always ask permission for whatever I do. I make sure that they understand what's going to happen before it happens. Realmente, eh, Codex desde ahí se fue, digamos, proyectando hacia las comunidades, eh, pero posteriormente eh, se pensó de que Codex tenía que seguir viviendo de algo, tenía que ser sostenible de alguna manera, ¿verdad? porque el apoyo externo eh, se ha retirado considerablemente. Si hablamos de España, eh, eh, ahorita están en plena crisis, y, y entonces era de donde nosotros recibíamos los, los fondos para poder operar. Y entonces eh, la situación fue de pensar en, en aprovechar de mejor manera los, um, 
los recursos que se tenían en el medio, que se tienen en el medio, hay en este caso es el café. El café es un producto, digamos, muy bondadoso, eh, muy bueno, eh, que, que, digamos, tiene muchas ventajas sobre otro tipo de producción, como los vegetales, por ejemplo. Los vegetales, si no los comercializamos en una semana, se nos, se nos pierde. ¿ya? El café no puede aguantar hasta un año. ¿no? Tenemos ocho organizaciones de base. Y de estas, seis son productoras de café. Y dos que no, que no, que no producen café. ¿ya? Estas dos es una organización de mujeres que está organizada en el municipio. Tiene 350 mujeres. Y bueno, aquí en Guatemala y en Latinoamérica y en muchos otros países... Eh, la situación de la mujer eh, también ha estado en desventaja sí. ante la situación de los hombres. ¿no? Entonces, ¿cómo nosotros ir integrando de alguna manera, digamos, a las mujeres a la vida social, productiva, económica de, 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 de las comunidades? ¿no? Entonces, eh, es por eso que la Organización de Mujeres está alineada a Codech y tiene sus representantes en, en Junta Directiva. ¿no? Y también por otro lado tenemos otra organización que no produce, no produce café, que es el Consejo Magisterial. El Consejo Magisterial pues está compuesto por todos los maestros, los maestros de aquí del municipio. ¿ya? Porque nosotros en algún momento trabajamos en algunos proyectos pequeños de, de apoyo a la educación. Con lo del premio social nosotros apoyamos a la educación ya sea con becas, eh, con capacitaciones o con algunos apoyos puntuales ahí para la educación. Y los que conocen mejor de esto son los maestros. ¿no? Entonces también los maestros están agremiados a todo eso. Eh, porque no estamos viendo solo la cuestión lucrativa, solo la cuestión económica, sino que lo estamos viendo un poco más integrando. Y ahorita vamos a empezar un proceso de capacitación ahí con, eh, con las mujeres productoras para orientarles, digamos, sobre la importancia de la salud reproductiva ¿va? Que, que se ha visto. En el municipio siempre han habido muertes maternas, eh, en mortalidad infantil también el índice eh, ante otros municipios, pues es, es alto. ¿va? Entonces, eh, son varias cuestiones las que nosotros, digamos, vamos viendo para, para, para proyectarnos hacia las, hacia las comunidades. ¿va? que es para la presión alta, sí, sí. regula, otro dice para curar de susto, susto. cuando alguien se asusta, sí. ¿verdad? Y muchos también lo usan como cuando alguien va corriendo y se le pone un aire acá, aire, sí. sirve para, para hacer caos. Sí. Cuando es quebraduras, digamos si es quebraduras en aquí, aquí no tan fácil puede uno colocar una hueso a, a su lugar. Estaban con esta planta que para muchos es muy, muy no tan conocida, pero este es un para diarrea, ¿verdad? Para, para eliminar, para parar. Y está un curso de farmacología. Y en farmacología seleccionó la doctora, es una doctora que se llama Belly, no es de San Antonio Vista. Mencionó lo que es la flor de muerto, de que la flor de muerto lo usamos algunas personas, lo usamos en nuestro medio.